Cool. So yeah, it's it's really great uh, to be here also in a in a smaller group today. Uh, then um, last week we had like I think 12, 10, 12 people. This time it's smaller, but it's it's wonderful. I uh, I, I I'm not sure if J Jason and uh, have you been there last time as well? Yes. Cool. Sorry. I I I was maybe I'm I'm actually Zoom calls beyond six people in the call. I'm always getting overwhelmed and <laughs> so apologies. Uh, I get I, it's why I, I'm actually quite happy for the size. Uh, it's it's great. And um, yeah, I you know let me maybe it's it's a moment to 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 share with you this this um, this document and I. I just want to say, I, we, I by no means I want to drive this in any direction. Uh, I just felt maybe for for getting in the beginning of this call today and uh, spending five minutes on this question of like where do where do we want to go? How do we um, maybe create a context that that others that are joining the calls know know what can happen in the in the in the sequence of upcoming calls? Still, uh, I. I created this colorful, I don't know, it's, it's, it, we sh I should have followed any system, but it's just colors, you know, that are boxing and it's not a rainbow or any other thing. <laughs> but we have from yellow to red, uh, orange, green, uh, blue boxes that, that have no, the color has no meaning. It's simply different topics that were brought up. And this is like a, an idea uh, buffer that, that I, um, that I thought we could uh, we could look at briefly to understand, you know, whether this is something cool to say next time. Hey, we are going to focus on uh, cross world tokenomics, but I think probably that's not the first topic to start with because a lot of context needs to be created first. But uh, we for sure we have a topic um, that we are all very interested about, and this is the topic of identity and the meaning for Web three. Uh, social, which is a term I found now on Gitcoin grants popping up. Uh, and I said, mm, actually, that's that's not a bad way to, to frame it. Uh, we have um, uh, the question of how social networks should be governed in Web3, which is something that we are uh, quite into. And we've spent uh, uh, quite a lot of time with Philip and also with Mihai to, to understand how legal frameworks need to be there but what which other uh, mechanisms need to be there in place um, um, we had uh, Andreas and Andy um, I think you both came up with computing cultures um, and different practices that we could use um, and also the glass beat game circling sense making um, yeah and finally there are some um, there's a topic on moderation that actually I would put myself in because I'm super into moderation. Let this, I just write my name there quickly that I don't forget. Uh, and the last one would be about what what would Web3 social, if that seems to become a thing now, you know, uh, mean for um, uh, for I mean how how could such a conversation evolve also um, beyond the conversations we have here? How can this be? Uh, looped into maybe a kernel curriculum at some point even you know this is I, I expect that there are probably um, many ideas of what this means and and they are popping up now and it will be nice to 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 you know to catch those participants early enough when when they are still in this wonderful beginning phase where they can say oh this is cool actually we have the same idea uh, or we we are working on similar things. That's cool. Let's let's collaborate before they are starting to dive down into their caves and later on realize could have been nice if we would have worked together. But it's kind of sorry, it's too late. We are competitors now, you know. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So this is this is this is my part uh, for this call. Just throwing this out here and. Uh, whether you guys feel this makes sense to to pick a topic that we can then also prepare in the next uh, for the next call in the way of saying this is the one that we will talk about, but I'm open to any other feedback as well how we should work. You know? And it will be like something like a, like an open source. We are always going to update it with something that you propose, something that comes out as a 
topic of interest during one of these calls. Uh, but we just want to have something as a start and maybe we will start updating with the time. The, the point also is if you um, hear Paul throwing right uh, Philip uh, Paul Pangaro in, in the mix and conversation theory that if we if we have a conversation, no matter how it ends, if we can then prepare from that point for the next conversation, we can already invite also those that we think will be benefiting or adding to the to the topic in the next round. You know that that was also the idea of giving this now that we have a few calls going forward, still some some kind of uh, you know time to 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 form this structure. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, all of these topics seem fascinatingly interesting. Uh, and before I throw my votes in the sorting hat, I see Philip has unmuted himself. So maybe he has some Pangaro gems to share with us before we go. Uh, I have maybe a 10 second contribution, although I just unmuted myself because I previously muted myself because my dog was making a hell of a sound. So, <laughs> That might not be the signal he thought it was, but um, yeah, I think talking with with uh, Mick Co Martin earlier this week, there's a, an eagerness to make sure that we can collaborate on a number of levels concurrently, which will each uh, qualify and increase the value of each other. If you know what I mean, if we just work to a philosophical or, or, or spiritual or conceptual level, well, that's it's fun, but uh, and if we just came down into the nitty gritty of you know writing code and looking at repos, then that's kind of fun. But so there's probably three or four levels where, like I say, we can progress them more concurrently, and that will make each level, each work stream, all the more valuable. So I'm I'm, I'm still learning how kernel works. I'm still working out how how you how you organize how you uh, corral. Um, yes, and I, I guess we're just trying to play into that. So that's, that's, that's all I would say on the matter. Wonderful, thank you. Yes, the um, it's a funny story, which is that uh, we, there, there is a, a team of kind of seven stewards at the moment. Uh, and when we, um, brought on Simon, who is the most technical of all of us and who is leading the work on kernel services. Sid, uh, who is also one of the people that joined a little bit later on, welcomed him with the message, welcome to the madness behind the method. Uh, and I think that that's as good as a description of how kernel organizes <laughs> as I've heard in a long time. Uh, it is as you know, kind of voluntary and not coercive and all of these things which have come to be a big part of sort of the deeper social fabric of Web3. And that means that conversations like this which occur can occasionally draw 20 people and can occasionally draw four people. Um, and the work for me in that particular regard has always been about uh, just a continual refinement of my own expectations. And it, it like is from an organizational perspective quite difficult to manage, right? Um, but from the perspective of individuals within the wider permeable body that is kernel, it's a wonderful practice because you never ever know what's gonna happen when we open one of these calls. Uh, and primarily what that shows you is your own your own expectations. Um, so that's, that's that's my own perspective. Others have different ones. Uh, most people agree that there is definitely some madness behind the method, though. So that's <laughs> not shared ground. <laughs> and, and and by and just adding to this, I think that's why I I feel like both. Uh, I feel like okay, this, this, this is good that we do this, but also I feel like, oh my God, maybe it's already too, enough, too much structure, you know? So it's like, if we, if we say, this is the, uh, the agenda for the next call, like we might scare away because people might think, oh no, no, but I, I, don't, I don't want to know what's gonna happen, you know? So 
if we we I, we are, we should definitely be open for the middle ground and we should let us be pulled in any direction that that, that opens then during the call because this is an exploration right but uh, exactly yes so you know one of the things that i think in this regard is that um philip is fond of quoting one of my favorites uh bantu sayings right it's most prevalent in easy zulu but there's another bantu language and many in fact uh the one that is closest to easy zulu is easy closer which is what they speak in my neck of the woods uh and the phrase is umuntu gumuntu gabantu a human being is only a human being through other human beings. There are equivalent phrases in many parts of the world and an essay coming out next week quotes both that and the uh, Mohawk version, which I cannot say as fluently, but uh, it expresses a similar sentiment. And the reason that I bring it up is because I think that's probably for this call the most interesting place to uh center our discussion is like web3 social and it ties to what i was just saying because like when we really do the work of individuation when we're willing to show up knowing that like all of these common methods by which we measure our own importance and our own status and our own reputation like how many people are listening the number of attendees the fact that a call is recorded or not <laughs> all of these little environmental things uh actually serve an enormous they, they are an enormous pool of resources for our own like individuation which then enables greater sociality because those two things really very deeply go together and the reason that it seems to me to be like the most kind of fertile place to begin is because it allows us to explore many of the dimensions that Philip has pointed at, whether that's like, okay, how do we actually link these things together with code and look at each other's repos and, uh, you know, and hopefully not engage in a pissing contest. And then how do we like think about this stuff? in terms of the level of human relationality, our horizontal connections to one another, the very grounded and uh, compromising world of uh, you know, human sociality, and then the kind of more esoteric or like spiritual or philosophical side of like otherness and differentiated sameness and what does things really mean to us all plays plays a role um, and you know in that regard perhaps for the like one thing that i would really love to hear you speak about uh is this this idea of transpersonal data and how it opens up a view towards like handling data and thinking about what data is that is quite different from some of the stuff that we might see, for instance, in Gitcoin grants around 14 Web3 social. Uh, it's interesting. I've just finished listening to an interview that uh, the LinkedIn podcast series conducted with Gavin Wood at Dav Davos a few weeks ago. Uh, Gavin Wood of Ethereum co-founder, uh, Polkadot founder, Web3 Foundation co-founder fame. Um, he's definitely in, in the thick of it. And he, uh, for a computer scientist who are uh, often very focused on nodes and edges, uh, his understanding of what could be possible is definitely definitely up there. But he still, perhaps it was just because he was simplifying it for the audience of a LinkedIn podcast, or perhaps just because he's been lower down in the stack and he's just, you know, popping his head up at this level uh, more recently. Uh, he still describes people as the nodes and then the social graph talks about the edges saying that you know i know andy andy knows me so that's an edge between the two of us 
And if we can just map humanity that way, then that's fantastic. And I've got my data, Andy's got his data, so my data's on my node and Andy's data is on his node. And I'll, uh, you know, this has worked quite well for client server and peer to peer so far. So why wouldn't it work for, for human beings? And I, and I find that it, it, funnily enough, for a bunch of information technologists doesn't necessarily riff off the best of information theory, let alone psychology or sociology. Uh, there is, as far as I'm concerned, no point storing or considering personal data as being node-like. There is nothing on the node. I am not on a node. I am, that would be like being on a, I guess the closest to me being on a node with my own data is being stuck on a desert island or by myself, in which case identity really is meaningless because there's nobody left to identify me, right? It's, it's so anti-sociality. It's so antisocial that I can't imagine that anybody setting out to work in de social or decentralized social or web three social or de web social, whatever you want to call it, uh, can have any hope of succeeding if that's their mechanistic mindset. So all information by definition in human society is relational. It's, it's on the edge, it's between people. And so we need to understand fundamentally how the, the and as soon as possible what that what that means for the the lowest level primitives in all variety of code technical code legal code social code what does that actually mean if we're going to engineer to respect that if we're going to engineer to augment that as opposed to engineer to ignore that uh, to severe psychological and sociological detriment so it's i'm 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 keen, as I know Colonel is, and I know Akasha is, to code. I'm keen to understand how the different code bases interact. I want to learn by doing. At the same time, I look concurrently in this place to my early comments, I think it's essential to convene a, a diverse, multidisciplinary team to question the assumptions in those early iterations uh, to point to the, the technical debt, in other words, the stuff that we've tried in phase one, but we know we're going to just have to hit the trash can with, because it's not going to be adaptable in any way to the next phase. But it, it's that, it is that, it's an ongoing conversation between an, a multidisciplinary team, our understanding of the human condition that perhaps not every computer scientist carries with them. And bringing those computer scientists bringing those devs bringing those architects along with us for the right so we can we can we can play at it to be honest i i so for example i mentioned it before i don't think in fact i'm pretty sure i would say i'm 100 percent confident but don't ask me to write a paper about it uh, there, there is no way that anybody can instantiate or or, or fulfill their dreams in the social uh, web through social entirely in a GitHub repo. It, it, it cannot be entirely technical code. It has to be social code, the social norms and expectations, the cultural aspects, cultural design, the way we do things around here and the way we don't do things around here, not just because the crypto won't let us. And it will be legal code in the mix as well. And it's, it's only when we have a sophisticated understanding of those three code bases that maybe there's a fourth of them. Um, and only when we have that multidisciplinary conversation and only when we also qualify the thinking with the doing and the doing by the thinking will we make progress and may we make progress sooner rather than later because i really feel like facebook's and they're like are not doing us proud great I, I i can i say something so i think it sounds awfully complicated uh, what you said it is, and preferably, it um, has to be, because the requisite law of complexity yeah. says it needs to be more complex than the complexity you're trying to address. Yes. Okay, true, that's true. At, at the same time, you know, um, I think I just want to, uh, I mean, looping us back to Web3 social as a term, uh, I, 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 first of all, I, I don't know if I like it, but at, at, at least it's better than decentralized social in a way. It sounds weird. Anything that is decentralized is like a technical term and it doesn't, but just to the complexity, um, 
Uh, Before you say that, Martin, can I just make up for one error okay. in our conversation yeah. just then? We conflated complication and complexity. They're two okay. different things. And yeah, yeah but... Well, so, so it can be simple and complex, preferably. It doesn't necessarily yes. have to be complicated to be complex. Okay, that's true. That's great. Exactly. Because I always decide the two things we always also rub each other on. It's like this, this problem with we do. Uh, complex and complicated and so, in nature. Things are usually the, the beauty lies in the simplicity of the solution. But obviously, when you stack many simple things on top of each other, they get complex. So uh, a car, the car is complicated, lots of moving parts, yeah. uh, but not complex. It's not, it's designed not to exhibit emergent behavior by definition. You don't want your car to do that. At the same time, yeah. traffic yeah. is not yeah. complicated, but traffic is complex. So that's the one, yeah. that's the metaphor, the that's, um, that's example the metaphor, I always yeah. give. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful, exactly. So, and here's a big chance. And the chance that we have is that we are, and that is the way, like when you listen to all of these leaks that come out of Facebook and, and all the way how awful they are uh, and the decisions that are being made, the great chance that we have is that the business model basically was put in front of anything in, in the terms of the Web2 web social. And it's the driving force for all decisions made. And I think really doing things the way that they would just make sense of how to do them, uh, you know, in terms of toxic content, in terms of the algorithms that I use to present content to someone, these are all things that we can now change because we, we hopefully are not going to go back to the same uh, paradigm of I am the owner of that server. And for that reason, I, I want to first, first need to pay for the server and second need to maximize my profits for the shareholder interest in this. So that's a, it's a, it's a e simple maybe assumption that I have that simply knowing that and being aware of that we could, we could, we have a chance to change um, the way that social networks are operated and are going to be less toxic. The, the challenge there is, of course, that whenever you, and we, I've seen that as an avid student of many of the projects that are emerging in the space, they are always, not always, but very often, very quickly falling back to some kind of model that has a traditional economic incentive behind that is Hmm. I, I have created this company and now it's a, it's, a, it's a network business, so it's scaling rapidly and there, can be, there are profits that can be made. Uh, so yeah, I just leave it here. But that's, that's one observation that the solutions, the, 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 the potential better solutions are already there, but and, no one dares to implement them. And one example that just, just popped up now, Martin, you remember when you were researching the moderating practices from you know, different communities what what came 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 up as a very surprising a insight was that people who created these started all these communities even in web3 they were feeling that they are entitled to you know govern them uh, which was not very much in line with the web3 principles of decentralization and stuff so it's like you know kind of detaching you completely from your habits coming from web two will take time and uh, and work and, and martin had like uh, you know shared that with us some time yeah. ago and we were like you know finding it very very interesting yeah it's the uh yeah i would love uh one of, one of the aspects of this which seems to me also just worth discussing in the uh, in your presentation last week to this notion of like social, legal, and technical code bases, and perhaps a fourth estate yet to be discovered at Philippine sets. Uh, I wonder like, uh, Kokeb or Malensu or Jason, if you have like questions or thoughts about like these, the way in which those three kind of play together, like social, technical, legal, uh, and had some comments there uh, before. I, you know, Pepper, Philip, and Martin with other random computer scientists. Yeah, no, I, I, I realized I probably missed the first meeting. I think it was, um, I, I did see the uh, Kasha, I think that might have been in the kernel building kernel 
um, some of the uh, conversation kind of bled over. But I, I've been listening to um, um, this book by Ray Dalio, which you know I'm sure it's not your favorite person in the world, but it it is interesting um, hearing his perspective from a uh, uh, you know investment banker how he you know, analyzes history and context and how he right now is kind of analyzing, you know, the U.S. and China um, in, in kind of both their political, cultural, economic struggles. Um, and, you know, I, I would have to say that I'm probably very naive in terms of like the social political aspects of the world. But, you know, I, I find coming into Colonel, you know, is, you know, it's not about just the you know, coding, it's about the humanity and society and context. I think after reading, um, you know, Sapiens and some other, you know, talks about other books about how like, you know, humankind has evolved. And, you know, to me, it's kind of like, you know, in enlightening me to how, uh, you know, there's a lot of factors at, at play in how, you know, uh, world unifying, you know, fiat currency, how the U.S., you know, has been very dominant with the dollar. You know, I, I'm, I'm privileged. I, I live in the U.S., so I take it for granted at, at, at some of the um, <laughs> privileges afforded in the U.S. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, I've, I've visited China on business trips in the past year and looking how their economy and country is evolving. So, you know, to me, when you when you look at like your, your question there, or, or, or at least on the document, the cross world tokenomics, like to me, you know, the whole Ray Dalio's premise, like, oh, it's China versus US. Whereas, you know, I think a lot of these, um, you know, potentials and capabilities, you know, especially with blockchain, is that, you know, if you align the philosophies, if you align, you know, people across the world, you know, it doesn't need to be like that. Um, right. And so, you know, to me, it's very, I, I don't know how much more I can really add. You guys seem to be way more advanced in terms of your research and thinking. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to educate myself on this way up there. But to me, um, you know, I, I, love, I love your writing, Philip, about the whole, uh, you know, personal data interaction, right? How, you, how data is, is actually can be between people and then not maybe this kind of global um, uh, interchangeable exchange, right? Maybe it's just purely on a very serialized person to person transaction. Um, so, you know, I'm just happy to, to listen and hopefully I can learn and perhaps I can contribute. I have some, I have some thoughts on that, but Koke, please. Mitko? Mm -hmm. um, um, I really love what you shared earlier about what Martin had um, the insight that Martin had uh, had found from from reading about or learning about uh, governance within these communities and how uh, the the word that sticks out to me is like you have to detach from those habits, um, which is like you want to govern what you what you had started or not one and that one individual had started and so the same way that um you know you had said we have to detach from those habits andy your question about um like the social legal and maybe technical aspects of of what's important here it's like how do we um well the first thought that comes to my mind is um those who are technical um you know do they have that that legal knowledge and then and then uh where does the the social um kind of understanding of humanity come from so those three to me are so not far away from each other but the 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 way in which um you have to think almost to to be able to um action any of those those three separate um kind of i will call them industries uh it's almost like how do we detach from what we know about what 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 legal represents or what social represents so to me that's that's what's top of mind 
incredible 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 thank you so much Lorenzo I know you joined a little bit late you're very very welcome and it's delightful to see you thank you so much uh, do you have any, any thoughts you'd like to add to the stone soup yeah thanks no I'm yeah I'm really late um it's only the first session happening and I joined a bit uh, other work thing going on um yeah so I was just trying to hold a conversation from what you on the um, contribute right now but I'll just say that um well for me I probably look at it often from the perspective of someone from um, a developing country in terms of how we use and um, interact with social media. Um, I feel like right now I'm part of a project and we're trying to think through how to how to um, how to engage different uh, communities that are not as familiar with social media. Um, especially when it comes to verifying certain intangible things around culture. So um, it's very easy for young people, like, I mean, young people can just go back and forth and everybody claims to know something, but all they know is very bits and pieces of information that they picked up on the internet. Um, but I mean, the internet is really about who's posting the most often and um, who has some memes to go with it. Like it's, it's more really about attention than like, really verifying or provi providing uh, credible information. I mean, there are certain few sources like maybe like Wikipedia where they've kind of, they've kind of, you know, carved out their space in on the internet where they can provide some form of um, reliable information, not completely reliable, but at least there's this community of practice that has done a good job. So for example, we were trying to look at culture aspects of um, passing on information from a very rich um, culture from like, uh, this was from an African perspective. And then, so we were talking about, oh, let's do a DAO and that would be great and people can contribute and verify. But it's like, it, it's it's a very, <laughs> it's it's take, but a DAO will only include a very small number of people. These are people who have, who actually know how to set up some kind of uh, a web three uh, identity or, you know, um, address or presence. And already that extracts you very far from like regular people who can actually, who have value to contribute, but to go through all the trouble of entering web three, like there's just so many barriers to entry. Um, and so, yeah, so we were discussing how do we bring how do we bring these two different um, communities or these two different um, these two different like types of knowledge together, like the much more traditional um, knowledge among people that uh, like okay in our culture we consider them like elderly and they they have. They're, they come from a more, much more oral tradition because a lot of them maybe might not be as literate. So let alone not even as familiar with technology. And so how do we bring those two to, to be able to participate in, in a DAO almost and verify information that should go on to a platform so that we're bridging this information and not losing all the information but also kind of bringing along people who would otherwise get left behind from the whole Web3 experience. Incredible, incredible. Your work continues to inspire all of us. So thank you for sharing some of that. Yeah. And these kinds of questions are uh, like very much at the forefront of, I mean, this discussion for sure. And it's, it's, it's so much about like synthesis in many different ways of the legal, social, and technical, or of different worlds, or of different ways of being oral and the literate, different ways of seeing the world, different ways of interacting with it. And more than anything, it's like, how do we uh, envision and then co-create like systems which are more organic than 
machine-like, right? Because the organic has this ability to adapt and to be flexible in complex environments, which are constantly changing and in which new situations are constantly emerging. And it reminds me like very deeply of two things. <laughs> First, Jason, to what you said about like, oh, you all seem so well-informed at this thing. <laughs> There's this wonderful uh, biologist. First of all, it's bullshit. <laughs> That's the simple answer. Second of all, there's this wonderful biologist called E.O. Wilson. And E.O. Wilson wrote many, many things, but one of which is called Consilience. It's such a beautiful book. And in it, he makes this point that like the, like the most simple science and therefore also the most fundamental is like mathematics and then physics and then chemistry and then organic chemistry and then biology and then you know, eventually you get up towards like anatomy and medicine and all of these kinds of things. And, and then only do we get to kind of neurology, psychology, sociology, politics, humanities. And the humanities are sciences. They're just much, much more complex than like physics and maths. Although our culture has it completely the wrong way around. We validate and you know, celebrate the physicists and the mathematicians because these people can make like seemingly certain statements about reality and the degree of their error <laughs> whereas you know us poor humanities folk we're like totally lost we're like we don't know <laughs> uh, and so you know it's it's easy this is the interesting thing is it's very easy to make like quite definite or definitive statements about the technical and fairly eagle on the legal fairly easy on the legal side and almost impossible on the social side and it's because it's much more complex uh, and what it reminds me of is if you go back, Philip, and look at like, you know, some of those old Alan Kay presentations uh, and the whole world that he was a part of, he's like a very big part of pointing to like how like text algorithms for rendering paragraphs come directly from uh, and foraging observations and how TCP IP and the work of Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn and all of these people has something almost organic about it, right? It was, it was, it was moving away from maintain and fix to navigate and um we need andreas for the exact words but like as you move away from the sort of um machine grid uh you know cog in a cog in a machine kind of world into the organic it's no longer about like fixing and maintain and squashing bugs it's much more about like how do you navigate and compromise those are the words that he's constantly using. And what it makes me think about in terms of your analogy of transpersonal data and nodes and edges uh, is like, so we all agree here, like nodes is a silly way of thinking about sociality and Web3 social, but like how at a very like concrete level, how do you make the edges fuzzy? How do you make the edges organic? Like, what does that mean to you in Akasha? And what would it mean if we like sent you a kernel person with a bunch of data associated with them who then wanted to like interact in the Akasha world? Like, how is that data fuzzy? You know, and like now they, they're in Akasha and they like do some more stuff and more data accrues to like this dynamic transpersonal thing that is going on. How does it like feed back into kernel? <laughs> you know, like what is what does a fuzzy edge mean in the well, I, I mean, sometimes I put it uh, by referring to cyborgs because everybody knows what a cyborg is. It's, you know, it's your sort of favorite future, future sci fi sort of manifestation of the future of the human species. And I always remind people actually, in the cyborg, there's still a human being. We haven't just replaced ourselves with the tech, we haven't abdicated to the tech. It's the technological augmentation of the human being. And so I so that's sometimes the way I put it, just in case, just in case in the you know the web three crypto networking enthusiasm, we do sight of what it means to be human and how we can continue to amplify that humanity rather than damp it down. Um, so I so I'm so how would you, Andy, approach? You know that when I said earlier that we needed to progress, you know, this fantastic conversation. Um, at this level, but also move things at lower in the stack in terms, if you like, in terms of working with various code bases. I, I would love to work out how we can have 
both those work streams, if you want to simplify it into sort of two levels instead of multiple, how we can move both those work streams forward so, so concurrently and who more importantly or just as importantly should be involved in in those two work streams yeah i think that's the the who question is the heart of it uh and this call uh can continue to be uh, you know, an open and emergent complex affair, uh, which I also have some words to say about in a moment. Um, the, the other who in terms of like the, the code is, um, is really like Simon and Rory. Uh, we, we, and, and you are present in those Friday calls anyway. Uh, and we probably still need a, like probably like another two weeks of just like sorting out some really basic kind of feedback on our own end in terms of that but then like the the first and simplest thing as i've said before is i think just like what would it mean literally to have like a login with button for a cache and it doesn't have to be just with kernel right i mean i think that you can explore that in a much more general and abstract sense but like maybe kernel is the first manifestation of that and like log in with and then a bunch of data comes with that and the question is okay like what, what do we do with that and are there ways and that leads us into like the much deeper discussion you know of like <laughs> not just federation but something much more deeply social because like as i say now somebody is like a kernel fellow and logged into kasha and doing things in both places that perhaps like don't necessarily you know that are context appropriate right like what you're going to do in a cache is not what you're going to do in kernel some of it might have overlap others might not and like what does that mean for that exactly yeah and, and I, I just uh, adding to this i i don't think because this is like we are asking each other questions back and forth here <laughs> and it's great because this this reveals that we are not entirely i mean it's really we need to start walking that path and then we we, we can stop with a with a with the luxury of not asking and where do we put the ads inside you know and uh, wh where can we add the advertisement banner now so uh, like we can really go into send um, and step back and ask what could be an alternative way of implementing it uh, or what are the risks by doing it this way are we gonna go down the same way as, as before and I, I need to say this is what I sometimes fear is inevitably happening because of the way that the technical code sometimes is structured it's a challenge also for the development side to to you know not fall back to the to the very same patterns that we already have that are uh, top down you know they whitelisting and 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 like allow us a permission uh, and and so on uh, yeah so that's a, that's a, it's a big challenge and and yet it might it might be that if we only find a good way this time to add also these social agreements and contracts there as well that are allowing for the transparency need and uh other other and and, and and legal aspects maybe even you know to because if you enter any space there are rules and there are expectations that we naturally abide by and we wouldn't just say that we don't do it in in in, in the in the technical space as well but yeah so it, it's hard because as soon as you try to insert information technology to substitute for pre-existing societal mechanisms, you're it's it's I think it's it's one of those rare occasions where the legacy system is more powerful than the one you're trying to put into place. Usually with the legacy system it's a bit crappy and here's an improvement, whereas actually <laughs> human species is pretty darn good at all this fuzzy stuff if i can yeah pick and up a key keyword from from handy and, and actually if anything crypto is all about ones and zeros it's either on or it's off it's 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 it either yeah. is a zero knowledge proof 
or it didn't pass the zero knowledge proof. So that bringing that binary thinking into a much more nuanced and quantum existence is, is it's a challenge and we're doing it very clumsily at the moment. Let me loop in what I liked a lot about Milenzo, what you said about the, the challenges you have to, to, to uh, in, integrate uh, like less technically affine people to into this loop, right? This is super important. And at the same time, I mean, you know, with the with with onboarding such people to this technology comes also so much risk and there's a big responsibility to do it the right way. And um, it is not re restricted to, let's say, uh, you know, as you said, maybe more development, uh, developing countries or so. It is it is a worldwide problem that if you bring technically illiterate people into some, you know, social media stuff, it creates terrible. Con it has terrible consequences. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, the 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 the, the fact that they are suddenly. Uh, messaging and talking to someone apparently very close to them people are misunderstanding this and don't don't realize that this is uh that the facts that they are consuming in this way are no no are no facts for example right that like oh but this, like i'm in this very private chat room with just four people and that, that, that's what they told me that i i need i need to believe what they say or that that should be true or whatever and in the end, it's not. They're being tricked and influenced, and we've seen this uh, happening everywhere uh, in the world. And uh, yeah, there there are a lot of uh, responsibilities we have. And at the, same, at the other aspect, I also like is that you know, reality is that like in Germany, ninety percent of the people I interact on a daily basis with outside, they don't even have a Facebook. They don't know, they, they, they hardly can, they are kind of stuck in the 90s, honestly, with like 1998 uh, uh, internet technology or something. Like we have emails. Oh, I need to send this email to 600 people. Uh, yeah, so I, I chunk it up in six uh, mailing lists because otherwise somehow magically it throws that email back from the server. I can't send it to 600 at the same time. Aha, ah yeah, you know? So it's, <laughs> so... Yeah, and then you in and then you you are not aware when you suddenly to this like time warp and uh, throw them into now you need to use a crypto wallet and and they haven't been part of this entire onboarding and learning process. It's a it's a big challenge. Yeah. Yeah, but I think. I'm but still, I think the issue also with the social media is just really still getting that balance right because we, um, like, I'm ambivalent about some of the more like metaverse kind of lifestyle. Um, because I, I like, I remember because when someone interviewed Mark Zuckerberg and he was talking about how <clears throat> I mean, the social media is just supposed to help you enhance your already exist your your physical life, but like um, sometimes when people talk, it's like they want to move the best part of their life and have the best moments of their life in a metaverse as opposed to the physical world. Mm -hmm. And it's really getting that balance. Like it's supposed to enhance your life, but not, I mean, for some people it's fine. I mean, maybe that's, they want to have their best, they have their best moments of their lives on the internet or playing games or doing things like that. But um yeah, I think for a, a lot of other people that they that they can still get value out of um, life in Web3 or Web2 and so on, but still having that balance, like you can have, still have this social, social interaction with people and not spending 80% of your time just, you know, scrolling, the end, endless scrolling on different social media. Like I'm also trying to find that balance as well. Um, like I only recently got introduced to Twitter and um, I still have to filter out a lot of garbage and figure out what really makes sense to me. Um, but I do find my, because I left Facebook and so I was trying to just purge myself of all, a lot of the necessary social media. And I think because of Kernel, I joined Twitter and I'm trying to follow some discussions about Web3. Um, but 
yeah, but for me, again, I still also have to relearn how to set boundaries around what's really adding value to my life and what's just taking away time for me and not really adding much. Oh, yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. This point about setting boundaries and detaching from habits are both very, very big things. And uh, we have in the past talked about, um, you know, the <laughs> Philip loves biological metaphors. You know, so I'll offer another one, which is the phospholipid membrane. You know, the perturbative beginning of life on Earth uh, is these kind of phospholipid membranes in the early kind of uh, soup seeing as we've been cooking stone soup here yeah, today and you know one of the great joys of membranes is that they keep out that which is harmful or would return the organism to thermodynamic equilibrium while still allowing for some exchange across the boundary and i think that that's a really useful yeah metaphor. i've seen this in the threat yeah, yeah, it's great. It was mentioned in the in our Slack channel, right? Membranes, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's, true. it's a really, really useful metaphor for like ways in which we can imagine something more than federation when it comes to kind of sociality in general. Yeah. And oh, please. No, no, just saying that really, I, I told, just to say 100% should be another topic that this, this, there is a big distinction, I think, between federation and what we want to achieve. Federation is not ideal. It's just some people have heard about it and then it got stuck. And then that's where they stop and say, there's Web 2, and then we do federation. And I think, no, <laughs> yeah, we need to go much farther than that. Yeah. Yeah. We like Mastodon, but we're not you know, fully behind. Sure, sure. <laughs> so, um, you know, again, the, the question arises as to what the, um, so in biology, like what are the protocols by which permeable membranes uh, figure out what comes in, and what is not allowed, right? Uh, and, and these are generally speaking, uh, very, 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 precise, almost quantum keys, right? Like, like the chemical either has a shape that fits or does not. And it applies to, you know, chimerality and the right handedness or left handedness and all of these kinds of things to find the manner in which some, uh, some molecules or substances are let in and others are rejected um, because there is like a receptor site uh, that you know, like pulls them in or it doesn't fit and they bounce away. And I was thinking about that and considering, well, okay, what is the um, analogy for that in this rather deterministic world of ones and zeros uh, that we find ourselves exploring? And it seems again, and I know that I keep on doing this and raising it at the end of the call, but like one of the, one of the objects that like may fit that definition is some kind of token. Uh, and it, it need not be a token as is currently imagined, even with economic value or anything, but some digital object that is passed uh, between on a public ledger is like a very interesting primitive uh, for thinking about like, okay, what does, uh, what does fuzziness actually kind of look like? Um, so yeah, I don't know where. I, it's a big I, topic. <laughs> uh, there's two comments on that one. The first one is actually when I challenge people to name personal data that is not interpersonal data, you'll be amazed how many people say well, DNA. And then a second later they go, oh no. <laughs> Oh, I just remembered where I got it from. Anyway, uh, but there's also a, uh, when you say token, sometimes I also think of totem, because I think in many ways, totem is as close to what you're thinking as token is. Am I right? Let me just get Mac dictionary up and check just to make sure. Uh, 
It's a, a natural ob object or an animal. I didn't know a totem could be an animal. I'm learning here. Um, that is believed by a particular society to have significance, uh, perhaps a spiritual significance. And uh, it's adopted for that significance. So there's something about that that is distinct from the economics, but is integral to the value, the contextual cultural value of the, the group concerned. Crypto totems. Uh, so first of all, because we're all about sociality on this call, my totem animal is an otter. And they live here on this beach. Cape otters. What? Cape Sorry, I've, otters. I, I've, otters. I've got I've got something missing here. You have a you have a totem animal. Is there something to do? <laughs> you, you know so little about me. <laughs> but I, now I don't one. know much about totems, obviously, having brought it up. Does everybody have a totem animal? And I've just missed missed the, 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 the story or are we has I mean, got the phoenix? Uh, yeah. Are you are you from the world that is described in this in the Golden Compass? If you have read this, this uh, science fiction book, ah, where every every human. Wow. Is <laughs> oh, we're really getting into it. Oh my gosh! You know, one of my favorite passages ever comes from that from Philip Pullman and the Soul mm -hmm. Life trilogy, right? Uh, she goes and she's hanging out with the witches, who are really good, uh, and they are like they're in the Arctic Circle and they wear barely any clothing. And one day she asks them, like, what kind of magic do you use to protect yourselves from the cold? And they said, no magic. She says, what? What do you mean, no magic? How are you not cold? And they say, no, we are. <laughs> we just like the feeling of that on our skin. And that, bye, Jason. <laughs> if you have to drop, please, uh, please feel free. Uh, we, just, we just like the feeling of that on our skin. And every time I feel cold, which I often do as an African, uh, I always just remind myself, no, it's not cold. It's just a, a, a new means to feel my skin. Um, but what I wanted to come back to this point uh, was that, you know, a token also has a meaning in computer science, Philip, which is the smallest possible uh, series of bits used to convey a message, right? Uh, and, and it has a similar meaning in linguistics. It's worth like kind of looking up the etymology of token uh, because it comes from the German and the Dutch, right? Tachen to teach, and, and then it has these oh, other wow. linguistic and and, uh, and uh, computer science specificities. And the thing that kind of has me like interested about them is that um, I think that they can be used in like in like very interesting ways that don't necessarily abide by like the standards that currently exist on chain mm -hmm. uh, for um, like uh, ongoing meaningful exchange of information which teaches each place that you walk into a little bit about who you are. Yeah. Uh, there, there, there has been uh, discussions uh, in the team Nakasha, when we had the uh, the alpha um, about these kind of painting or coloring of tokens and that, that it would not even require the transmission of that but it would be rather the embedding of this color within that you know that 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 token mix uh, so you could you could use this to actually to curate somehow content uh, by by adding your feedback on onto it by by this coloring process. It's a bit abstract now and a bit a uh, uh, while ago that we discussed it with Mihai. But this is something, yeah, I like it. I mean, I, I would have challenged you and said maybe we are maybe we are reducing it too much. But then at the same time, you're right. I mean, it's too oversimplifying the problem. But at the same time, you're right. If we can convey it as this the string of bits that's like the mini, the minimum information required, okay, that's that's something we should follow up on and, and think about what what would, would that mean in terms of uh, um, sharing sufficient context that, for example, when I walk in from a kernel into the Akasha world, uh, that that information is somehow is conveyed and there is this. Mm, magic exchange that allows us to to be within the context in the other area that we enter you know it's a uh, like 
as we know how to behave when we be we are in different contexts as well and that that somehow that totem so that animals carried with us walking with us and just like changing maybe the shape or the, the the form according to what makes is appropriate because we carry our the, these data that philip uh, that we are leaking all the time and that are coming with us in this digital form uh we carry them with them with us right and um and it would be very bad if we would reveal them all to everyone uh without having the context and if we had no choice about the about this either what to share when with whom so yes absolutely and the the last thing that i want to say about this is that philip also in his beautiful piece about transpersonal data linked to the open money manifesto and uh apart from a few spelling errors which offended me philip um <laughs> i'm kidding not in your piece the open money manifesto there's a wonderful uh a wonderful realization that you know we've kind of always used virtual monies and this is in the kernel syllabus you know like time of charlemagne had like virtual money the king would cry up or cry down the currency you know like virtual money is nothing new the point that they make about it in that manifesto which i love is that like virtual money doesn't exist so it's not bound by the same laws as physics as physical stuff and you can do what you want with it right and this sounds very abstract until you actually go and like for instance look at the system which runs daps dap.ps the curation system right like i had worked with simon de la Riviere and some other people on like bonding curves and all of these sorts of things and i thought it was interesting but like to me it was too complicated uh and the reason that it was too complicated was that like you put one token in you get another token out according to some particular curve and then I end up in a world where I have like a thousand different tokens, each of which has different governance rights, each of which is managed differently on chain. It's like so much overhead that I can't even begin to imagine it, let alone how many wallets I should have for good OPSEC. I now have like these tokens, <laughs> what a mess, you know? And if you look at how those contracts for dApps actually work, there is a curve, right? But like votes, so you, like you put SNT in, because I was having to work with the status network token, you put SNT in, and that allows you to vote, right? So technically there are votes that are minted, but you never get the votes as a token. They're just these virtual objects in the contract, right? That are produced in a deterministic manner based on how much is being exchanged in that transaction, right? And that virtuality is critical to the simplistic functioning of the system, which is literally, I just go in and I upvote or I downvote and it has a cost associated with it. And the more that this person has staked to rank their, their, their thing highly, the cheaper it is for me to downvote. Mm. Right? That's all I mm -hmm. see as a user. I have an extraordinarily simple interface that I understand. I don't have to worry about like what's going on in the background, but what is going on in the background enables simplicity as a result of the creative use of virtual currency in the, in, in this case votes right mm -hmm. um and when you look at any other <laughs> uh any other curation system the, the vote is like it's a it's instantiated as an actual object in the contract you know it's all virtual right but but the computer scientists will know what i mean they, they actually like objects in the kind of you can see them and off you go and then you know you make a vote and even Gitcoin has done this which is just you know completely ridiculous to me because as i say like if you use this kind of thing it doesn't have to be particularly the system but this kind of thinking right it's like like Gitcoin grants can be completely managed by this kind of thing as well as the Gitcoin token because the big question in these kinds of virtual money systems virtual tokens all of this stuff is okay like how do we actually make the token in a manner which is justified and not contrived? I never had to face that problem when I was designing the DAPS curve because SNT was made prior to that work. It had happened through this ICO. There was a set amount that had been created in the like pre-sale, and that was it. So like I was not concerned with like the morality or the ethics or the design of what had happened with the ICO. It's just like, okay, I've got 6 billion, 800 million tokens. There's a set amount. And like, what can I do with these things now? 
So I didn't have to worry about like, how is the token like minted? But Gitcoin was like the perfect, the perfect test bed for that kind of thing. Because like when I fund a grant, that's a, that's an, a, an action on chain, right? So it's a yeah. transaction. I can look at it and I can be like, okay, if you funded any grant in Gitcoin, you get like a hundred Gitcoin, a hundred GTC as a reward, right? And that legitimately like has no economic value, but <laughs> GTC can be used to vote on and curate all of the grants that we see in any given grant round. And we don't need some fancy machine learning algorithm and a whole fraud and protection division to try and solve a zero of n problem, right? an O of n problem, like this thing that scales. Sure. The more grants you have, the more fraud and protection you have to do, right? And it's never gonna work. They don't know it yet, but like, <laughs> good luck yeah. to them. Uh, the, the point being, right, that like, you, you can solve all of that with like just creative use of virtual monies. And like, that's the kind of thing that I'm trying to point at here, right, which is saying that like we, there, there are means of thinking about like, what is the minimum meaningful transaction when a person moves from context to context that can be used to generate tokens that have functions across contexts. Right. Yeah, wonderful. This is really cool. Yeah, and that's like then, okay, cool. We have like different worlds, but interlinked and the thing which passes our membranes is like a very well-defined economic, uh, like token, <laughs> token. Mm -hmm. and yet that has no bearing on the particular principles, culture, or customs of each of the contexts that it enters in there, and they are free to define those in these like complex and emergent manners. Yes. I sometimes get overwhelmed by what we could work on together. <laughs> this is no, it's I, I, I really have to hold myself back because I need to say I, I'm a bit over time. I need to stop, uh, drop off the call now. But, but there's so much and this is so cool. Uh, and and the, the topic, Andy, that you touched on now has uh, I'm reminds me of a lot of con conversations that, that I had uh, in the past also with the Akasha team and with Mihai and that we. And you know, the, and the problem um, also touches on this curation uh, uh, and peer review and other topics that I am very interested in as well. And uh, I just want to, before I drop off, I, I just had one quick idea before that the, the beauty of this call should not be like uh, touched and changed by, by imposing a topic on the, pro on the call that is coming. Instead, this colorful list of things that we have in the beginning is our idea buffer, and you may add to it. And then when we come together and we see in the next call who's there, we, we feel with the composition of the people in the room or what just is uh, the most meaningful topic to dive in. Or if nothing is on the list, we just go on that. Because I think these conversations are so cool that I don't want to be the you know, uh, let's say like the manager that says, uh, and then for tomorrow, the topic will be, you know, and then all the people are like, oh, damn it, but we will never talk about X that I'm in. No, so the chance is always there. So taking back what I said in the beginning, let's do it this way. We keep this log. I'm, I'm going to add what we talked about today a bit and feel free to do the same, but we just keep it this way. And we have an That's... idea buffer though to say, actually now today, I want to touch on this topic written in life that, that's, five, you know. that strikes me as as same or a similar format to the world cafe format if you're familiar with world cafes true. that's true yeah um I, i'll okay. whack it in there in case that, anybody is I'm saying sorry. yes i love that martin and I have a see the rest of your day bye 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 i know that we would we need to circle back with the rest of the Akasha team as well because you are interacting with three people who don't write code for a living. Bye, take care. Thank you so much for joining us. On that uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for letting me. Um...
interrupt <laughs> your and, oh, really, you can't oh, imagine oh. how valuable <laughs> what you bring to our conversation is. It's it's so appreciated, really. All right. Thank you. Bye. Hey, bye. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm just aware that we need to uh, have a conversation about how we bring the Akasha dev team into this this conversation. Obviously, in the work stream where we write code. Um, goes without saying. Uh, so I'm, I'm I'm not sure whether the whether the next conversation we have, which I guess will be next week, although I'll be on holiday for two weeks, um, is the right, well, Miko, maybe you, me and Martin can talk about when we, or how we might um, bring the devs to this, this conversation yeah. so that their priorities, their work can be informed by these conversations or inspired by these conversations. Yeah. Or... I think, I think like as, as normally desk people are, they, they are very keen when things are becoming more specific. And, uh, you know, at least our dev team is, is that way. So maybe we can use the time between now and next call to asynchronously figure out, okay, what are the more specific things that we can discuss and see if the, the dev team can join at that point. And uh, I mean, that-, that You're point, right, you're right. They, they um, will need a bullet point list. There is no doubt. Yeah, I might. That, that, we know them, we know what they are passionate about and what they are not passionate about. So or, we, we or they want a Miro with some boxes and lines on it or something. Yeah, yes, yeah, you're absolutely, absolutely right. And and I think in the meantime, what, what I would also uh ask Andy is like, is there is is there anything that we from Akashic can do to also, I don't know, help kernel community to get more involved into that web social wild westing and you know kind of uh anything that you can suggest for us to do on slack channels or on 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 uh, anything any other channels that that might might help mm -hmm. yeah that's a uh, a good question um no, it, it don't we, need I, we don't need the answer now just 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 yeah something we can we can think of yeah i think i think just where we are at the moment with like the empty block and this moments of kind of like pause and space it has been across conversations that we've had like a little bit more difficult to get people engaged um because they're uh enjoying emptiness <laughs> i'm not gonna be summer of fluff to summer of fluff just started yeah. um but so like honestly like the most effective thing is for like people like me and Vivek and other stewards to like ping specific people and be like, hey, I think you will be interested in this conversation. Will you show up? And I do do that. And then like sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Okay. Um, Fair enough. I think that like if you felt inspired to uh, share like one or two more of the pieces on the Akasha bug or on Philip's uh, websites or anything from the high even. Um, you know, like think pieces channel or just like other channels, like in kernel, if you had something that like fit it in there, or if you wanted to tell like a story, <laughs> you know, about like Akasha and I don't know, meeting Mahai for the first time or something, like tell it in, in story time. And like interacting with like different people in those different channels will also like probably result in others flowing back here. Um, okay. Yeah, for, for, for the empty block, like I will just like, see what I can do in terms of herding the cats, which is really uh, one of my core competencies after all of these years. We are here um, to help. We are here to help. Yeah. 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 And if you, yeah, if you, if you do that, like, like find like the best and most meaningful things that you love online and like share them in the appropriate channels, uh, that'll be more than enough help. Excellent. And, yes. Yeah. That, that's a good, a good, uh, yeah. Uh, Good route that we can explore. We have a lot of magic in our back, right? Philip? I know that you do. <laughs> so do that. Cool. I'll get Simon involved on the technical front. We can work towards something more bullet pointy and wireframey for the devs. And sure. uh, we can, you know, I think that Martin's longer term idea of also having like a guild in the next block, which begins on the beginning of September, will also like bring a lot more new and fresh interaction. Uh, and that's, it's been like nice for us is that, you know, uh, it, 
it kind of like each thing has its season and then like you see that the energy does tend to like go down a little bit over time and that's not to be lamented it's expected it's the way of the world you know and then like spring comes again you know uh, and so that's and a guild is your name for people who've associated with each other on a particular topic or yeah yeah exactly we have we have like a like a, a scale basically which is like these the kernel like general channels where like kind of anything goes then we have jams which are like informal groups of people interested in a topic like privacy or identity or these kinds of things so we're like basically like a cache is like a jam and i love that word because it all it means dance but it also means like when i jam a system you know like i i bugger it up <laughs> <It's> <laughs> wonderful so I, I'm, I'm very into jams i think they're marvelous and then like guilds are what you will find under the build tab on the kernel websites so they tend to be like a little bit more structured and formal and they'll have like kind of four sessions in an eight week gotcha. block with like a little bit more of it doesn't have to be completely or but like a little bit more of an organized this is what we're going to do in this session so we did like a dao guild and kia Kregler ran it and it was like the history of dao's then we started our own like dao house dao and then we did like a bunch of things with that dao in the subsequent sessions, which have been planned out prior to, in order to, uh, like, yeah, take people on a guided journey. Um, that sounds fantastic. I mean, the, for me, the power of kernel is diversity, ideally the uh, diversity of disciplinary expertise and insight. But, and this is the awesome bit, everyone has invested a, a lot of time to get on the same page because they're going through the same syllabus, so, which just then means when you get those different expertise and different insights into the same room, they've got a common basis for conversation, for uh, even just painting a picture of what success might look like. They're, they're coming at it from this. So there's a, a, there's a greater opportunity for coherence. I love it. It's um, awesome. It's been surprising for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, 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 a new piece of writing on the challenge of human identity in this context, as you know, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, Charles is, is, is reading it this week, he's studying feedback next week on Slack, uh, but the Internet Archive slash D-Webcamp uh, have been open to publishing it um, under their auspices. Uh, I don't know if you know Wendy Hanamura. Guess who's organizing the library at the DWM camp? This guy. No way! So Wendy's been asking me to come out for it. Well, obviously it didn't run recently because of the pandemic, but it's always seemed like a blooming long way from Amsterdam. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to work out how to, to get out there. And end of August, I think, isn't it? Yes. And you happen to be looking after the library. I can't imagine anyone more suited to do that. Um, so I was going to just ask if, 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 for example, Charles comes back and says, well, I've just spent, God bless him, uh, some time with 10,000 words on identity. And it's, it's like in the kernel zone where the kernel, I don't know how you even approach this because I don't know how kernels necessarily governed, but how I, I guess I'm kind of talking to the right person to understand that if you saw this, uh, essay on the challenge of human identity in the digital age and you thought well that's 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 kernel that's 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 where we're at whether you you would like to be associated with that piece coming out you being kernel but then i'm thinking am i speaking to kernel because i'm not speaking to kernel but anyway you know what i mean so i don't know how how i even phrase it because you're not a traditional organization yes well i think um We have so we we have a blog of our own, and if you wanted us to republish it there, uh, just pending our own like reading of it, uh, that would be wonderful. And when I say our, I really mean like the vacant mind, because uh, it's not really like extended much beyond that at the moment. Um, so we'd be, and I I mean I I know you're writing well. I've read it for many years, so like I know that it's going to be uh, good, and I'd be happy to to republish it there. Or you know I mean whatever, if you want to 
adds something to the bottom of it when it gets published on the archive. Uh, where whatever you feel is good, uh, as long as you let me read it. <laughs> that's really that's like I the can one share it with you. Yeah, I mean, I just because the thing is, I, I've been I've written a lot of words in my time for myself and and for others bylining it. But I still am at the point where I appreciate that my command of language is such that I still can't believe people want to read it. <laughs> it always amazes me. So I kind of like saying, well, I'll wait until someone absolutely is explicit and says, yes, I'd like to read it. Um, but if you are actually saying, yes, I'd like to read it, I can share the, the, uh, the G-Doc with you so you can uh, at least uh, take a scan. Good. Yeah, do that. Uh, that's It's really like... <laughs> The thing that with kind of and like I, it will grow and change as we do, right? But like everything that we do is just like it 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 has to be like intentional and careful. That's like the, those are always the litmus tests. That we, so like right now, for instance, like we're you know a month long into a debate with our lawyer about contractors' contracts because we like we have some contractors. Uh, and like one of them is in India and can't receive crypto because of the regulations there. And so we have to find like an alternative means of paying them. And there's this wonderful platform called Deal, D-E-E-L, which like allows you to hire global employees in a regulatory mm -hmm. compliant manner and pay them or whatever. It's wonderful. And we were like, this is definitely the best thing since sliced bread. And then I went and was like setting everything up and it's the super slick interface. You know, it's like, oh, and use our template of contract. I was like, yeah, and I read this thing, and it is horrific. It's the it's the most imbalanced contract you've ever. It's, the company gets all the rights, inalienable, royalty free, worldwide, in perpetuity. We can exploit it however we want. Oh, um, a so basically, the TLDR is fuck you, is it? I mean, that's basically what it's saying. Just looking at this thing, I was like, this is the most horrific document I think I've ever read. <laughs> And so, you know, like the point being that, uh, like everything that happens in Kernel, just it takes a little bit longer than it does in traditional organizations. Not because we're disorganized. I think that we're actually like really quite well organized. It's just that we really pay attention to detail. So, like the litmus test is always like not what is the governance process. It's like have a few people read this, thought about it, reflected on it, and if they are like yes, then we're like cool. It works. Sweet. Um, uh, do I do I have an email address for you? I don't even know if I do. I have very mouthy. Andy at kernel community. A N D Y. Yeah, that's easy to remember. Super duper. Okay. <laughs> Lovely. Fabulous. Wish you a rest of your day then. Have a good one. Okay. Rest of the day and see you see you tomorrow. It's probably. Yeah. Oh yeah, Here. it's true. Kernel building kernel tomorrow. <laughs> go well. Go well. Please Bye. take care. Thanks, Andy. Oh.